So good evening, um, lady, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is uh, Dr. I, um, Grab from Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. Um, he's um, going to give tonight's talk on uh, device implantation techniques. Um, so we're both we're both from Scotland. Um, I regard myself as Scottish because I've lived most of my life in Scotland, and uh, um, so it's it's a privilege and and it's absolutely lovely to have him um, on 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 this platform, um, teaching and presenting. Um, and this to to um, Kaya Device Education Foundation, and that. So I'm I'm going to hand over to you, um, Dr. Grab. So I've made you the host as well. So okay, but thank you very much, Julius, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak to this group. I'm quite honoured to have the opportunity to present um, to to the international team. I'm very excited about uh, doing some work um, with Pace for Life as well in the near future. Uh, I'm going to try sharing my screen and uh, you can let me know if you can see the presentation. Um, you see that on your screen? Yep. That's good. I'll just make it full size. Okay. Does that look good? That's perfect. Okay. So thank you for inviting me to talk. Um, Julius, uh, my fellow Scott, uh, invited me to talk on device implantation technique, concentrating on the basic technique for implanting permanent pacemakers and implantable defibrillators. And perhaps on a future date, I'll have the opportunity to talk to you about more complex device implantation, um, but I'm going to stick very much to the basics. I'm a consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist based in Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, where we have the Edinburgh Heart Centre. We're a European recognised training centre for uh, implantable devices and cardiac electrophysiology. Uh, so we have uh, international trainees coming through and learning uh, about clinical EP and devices. And I've been working there for 21 years. Um, we deal with a variety of implantable devices, uh, pacemakers, defibrillators, CRT devices, and implantable ECG recorders. But the focus today will be on pacemakers and defibrillators only. So I'm going to start by talking about what you do before your device implant. And before your device implant, when you have your patient booked in, it's important that you have a checklist to go through to make sure that you're doing the right thing. I've had experience in our own hospital where we regard ourselves as being very thorough and careful of having patients arrive in the anaesthetic room. And I've checked the indication for the patient's device implant and that indication is no longer there. So for example, a patient who has had a myocardial infarction or been through cardiac surgery uh, complicated by AV nodal block. And by the time the patient uh, arrives in the operating room, they've been waiting as an inpatient for two or three days. Uh, the AV block has resolved. And in fact, that patient doesn't need a device implant anymore. So you need to check the indication for implant is still there, that it still applies, that it's not a transient reversible problem that has led to that patient's arrhythmia. You should check what your intended procedure is. So are you planning to implant a pacemaker only, or does that patient also have an ICD indication when you're pacing them? And also, what is the best type of device to implant? Is it a single or a dual chamber device? Uh, for Brady pacing, it's usually fairly straightforward uh, in the patients with sinoatrial disease or AV block in sinus rhythm tend to get a dual chamber device implanted. Um, whereas patients with atrial fibrillation and bradycardia would get a single chamber uh, ventricular pacemaker implanted. However, for implantable defibrillators, you should look at the data on your patient. Is this a primary prevention implant or are you implanting the defib because the patient's already had a ventricular arrhythmia? And if so, is there an indication to have dual chamber discrimination? Does the patient have a tendency to bradycardia? Or is there a risk of drug-induced bradycardia if you use antiarrhythmics, in which case you're better off using dual chamber device for rhythm discrimination and brady support? Thirdly, all of your patients, if possible, should have their left ventricular function assessed. 
because if you're going to be pacing in the ventricles, particularly if the pacing burden is likely to be high, as in a patient with AV nodal block, if your patient has left ventricular impairment, you should consider implanting a CRT device rather than a straightforward Brady pacemaker if that therapy is available to you. Can the patient lie flat? Does your patient have um, poorly compensated heart failure? One of the worst things is if you're in the middle of a device implant and the patient is getting distressed because they're short of breath. Uh, it ends up being a wrestling match. Sometimes the procedure will have to be abandoned if the patient cannot comfortably lie flat. So if necessary, the patient should receive diuretics, get them into shape to have their operation first, uh, make sure that they've got oxygen on during the device implant. And in some cases, you have to prop the patient up a little bit, have the table tilted, have a few pillows under the shoulders and under the head to get the patient into a position where it is feasible to implant the device. In patients with a history of chronic lung disease, you've got to consider this as well. Uh, and also that might influence your choice of access route. And I favor using the cephalic vein cut down approach in patients with cr chronic lung disease, because I know in these patients that if I cause that patient to have a pneumothorax, then it's going to be a real, real problem to deal with and the patient will become very unwell. Very heavy patients, that's a big problem in the UK. We have a lot of patients who are, are hugely overweight uh, and if the body ma mass index is greater than 40, then you can run into problems of poor oxygenation when the patient lies flat. And also it's a little more difficult to safely give sedation to patients that are that heavy. You've got to be pretty cautious with the dose and make sure that you don't uh, depress the respiratory drive too much. Next thing to check, is your patient taking anticoagulant medication or antiplatelet medication? Is there a possibility that that medication could be stopped for a while before the implant to reduce the chances of a hematoma developing uh, and also to reduce the chances if uh, tamponade occurs that, that that would be difficult to control? Uh, I tend to implant my devices um, on the non-dominant side of, of the patient. So most patients are right-handed, of course, so they would get their device implanted in the left side of the chest. Um, but left-handed left patients, it's preferable to implant the device on the right-hand side. One exception might be CRT devices in certain patients with difficult anatomies tend to be easier to implant on the left side than the right-hand side, but we're not going into CRT here. And finally, double check your patient doesn't have any allergies. Uh, some patients may be allergic to iodine containing preparations and what you don't want is skin blistering over the site of your implant. So just check these things and make sure that you use an appropriate skin prep and that the patient's not going to be allergic to either the sedatives or the prophylactic antibiotics you're using before the implant. Preparing the patient, preparing the skin site is probably the most important thing that you do during the entire implant. Um, one of my jobs is that I'm the main person where patients get referred to uh, if they have an infected uh, pacemaker or a defibrillator. Mm -hmm. So I take patients for device and lead extraction from the east of Scotland and north of Scotland, and we treat 40 or 50 patients each year. And a lot of these patients get device infections following a generator change. Uh, so I see the bad side of infection with device implants. Device extraction in patients who have had chronically implanted leads is a high risk procedure uh, with a high risk of morbidity and a risk of the patient dying as a result of the lead extraction. So anything that you can do to minimize the risk of infection is really important. And that starts before the patient arrives in the operating room. Now, what we do at Edinburgh Heart Center is that we get all patients to shower an hour or so before they uh, go to the operating theater, if that's possible. Clearly, we have some patients with temporary pacing wires or who are not ambulant where you can't do that. But where possible, we get the patient showered. We get them to use a chlorhexidine wash over the shoulder and chest on the planned side of the implant. We remove excess hair with clippers, not with a razor, because the razor will abrade the skin and stir up bacteria, increasing the risk of infection. So use electric clippers if you can to remove the hair. And also, 
we tend to find particularly with um, more urgent device implants that the ECG electrodes that have been stuck to the chest leave a residue and that residue can contaminate the wound. It's quite difficult to remove that using an antiseptic wipe uh, and the best way to remove it is with acetone or alcohol solution. We use chlorhexidine as our skin wash, but you can use povidone iodine as well. Uh, either of these is, is good and that should be applied in the operating room. Uh, we put one layer on, allow it to dry and then put a second layer on and allow it to dry before applying the drape. And uh, now we're, we're using um, a, a kind of Ioban drape, which is an iodine impregnated film uh, to put over the site of implant. I think that's quite helpful because the bacteria that contaminate pacemaker wounds are bacteria that get pulled into the wound from the exposed skin. So if you can cover that exposed skin as much as possible when you're working on the leads, when you're sliding the device into the pocket, then you're going to get far fewer bacteria contaminating that pocket and causing problems down the line. Finally, some patients don't have perfect skin. They may have blemishes on their skin, little spots, uh, little lesions. And clearly these may carry more bacteria than the average area of skin. So just avoid making your incision over any area where there's a skin lesion. Uh, keep that covered with the Ioban drape if you can uh, and incise in a cl clean area uh, if possible. Because this is what we're wanting to avoid. This is the typical kind of patient I get referred for lead extraction. Uh, this is a person who's had a, a generator change for a permanent pacemaker. A few months previously, uh, the wound has got infected and the device has just eroded tissue necrosis on the lateral side of the pacemaker where there's the greatest pressure. And now that that is beyond salvage, that needs to come out, the leads need, need to come out. And if the leads have been in for 10 years or more, that's a real risk to that patient. And conservative management rarely works for any length of time when you get a situation like this. For local anesthesia and sedation, um, I always say to our trainees that the best thing to do when you're doing a device implant is not to rush. Because if you rush, if you try and do things in a hurry, it actually takes more time. Because if you rush, and your patient's anxious, as many of our patients are. The patient gets jumpy when they feel pain in the operating room, will move a lot, will get distressed, and the implant will take much longer. And your focus won't be as good because your half of your mind is worrying that the patient is sore and how they're going to react at the next thing you do, rather than just concentrating on the job in hand. So it's a good idea once you've done your safety brief and been through the checklist to give the patient some sedation uh, and I'll come on to what we use in a minute. Get the patient nice and relaxed and then put the local anesthetic in. So check the blood pressure, oxygen saturation, give some sedation. Uh, we use a combination of midazolam and fentanyl, but in fact, just using midazolam would be perfectly fine. Uh, one to two milligrams initially. Wait three or four minutes, check the patient's okay, check their BP and oxygen sats again, and then usually give a second dose before we get started. And then for local anesthesia, my preferred agents are either 1% lidocaine or 0.25% bupivacaine. I quite like bupivacaine because it's a longer acting local anesthetic. So it's a bit better for uh, post-operative uh, analgesia. And I'll inject along the incision line, which you should have marked on the skin beforehand, uh, just in this kind of subcuticular layer. And then I'll in inject deep over where the pocket is planned to be. Uh, and then once I've cut down uh, and made my incision, I'll put additional local anesthesia or local anesthetic into the prepectoral fascia or into the deltal pectoral groove if I'm planning to do a cut down for the cephalic vein. The European Heart Rhythm Association has an expert consensus statement and a practical guide uh, about implanting pacemakers and ICDs. And I'm not going to go through all of this. It's a very, very busy slide. I'm not putting it up to go through it item by item, but it's got a traffic light system for recommendations uh, of how you uh, best implant your devices. And many of these recommendations relate to avoiding infection. Uh, and all the things I've mentioned so far uh, are, are covered with this. Interestingly, 
what EHRA do not recommend that you do is put antiseptic or antibiotics into the pocket where the device is implanted. And in fact, if you use an antiseptic wash, you might may actually cause tissue damage because the antiseptic has a very different um, osmotic potential to healthy tissue. Uh, you're going to cause cell damage. You may cause a little tissue necrosis. And then that creates an environment which actually encourages infection. Um, and they also recommend not using braided sutures for your final skin closure. Prophylactic antibiotics before the device is implanted are recommended, but the use of post-operative antibiotic therapy is not recommended by EHRA. So antibiotic prophylaxis, what I want you to do is not go into your implant thinking that the antibiotics you give are the protection the patient needs against infection. The protection the patient needs is for you to be a good implanter, to prepare the skin well, to have slick technique once you have enough implants under your belt so that the wound isn't open for too long, that you've got good technique avoiding bleeding into the pocket, which is a risk factor for infection, and that you're good at skin closure because a neat closure forms a very good barrier against bacteria migrating down through the tissue layers and into the pocket. That is supplemented by antibiotic prophylaxis, which makes some difference to the risk of infection, but it is mainly your technique and what you do beforehand that's the most important thing. Now, it's interesting, you go into the evidence base for antibiotic prophylaxis for device implants, and there isn't much evidence out there. And the only two regimes which have a good evidence base in random, randomized studies comparing antibiotic prophylaxis against no antibiotic prophylaxis are the first generation cephalosporin cefazolin, um, which has been supplanted by cefuroxime and cefotaxime, or a combination of intravenous flucloxacillin plus gentamicin. So these are the two evidence-based regimes. We use the latter regime in Edinburgh, we use flucloxacillin and gentamicin. And in patients who are penicillin allergic or particularly high risk, then we will use typoplanin, not because it's particularly evidence-based, but because it has a spectrum of action against a very broad range of um, uh, infective agents. So, um, sorry, I'm just looking at the message there. That's fine. Um, I'm just going to pause here. Can everyone still hear me? Because it, it's it's odd doing these talks on Zoom. You sometimes think people aren't hearing you. Are we good? We are perfect. People still hear you. That's good. Okay. Thank you very much. I will carry on then. If I can oh, me. can I just mention that um, to everyone that's listening, I have put um, something in the chat. Basically, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A. Um, there is an option to post any questions anonymously if you guys would like. Um, if you'd rather ask a question, you can raise your hand and the host will allow you to speak um, just for anybody who wants to kind of cut it and ask any questions. So thank you. Okay, thanks very much. So in the UK, we have an organization called NICE, which is the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. Uh, and NICE is the body which really decides what um, treatments are made available on the National Health Service in the UK. Uh, so they review uh, the data from the literature on evidence of benefit. Um, and also they look at the cost effectiveness of any treatment or intervention uh, that, that we might want to use uh, and then decide whether we can afford to use it in the national healthcare system. Uh, and so their statement on antibacterial prophylaxis for pacemaker insertion is that you either use intravenous cefuroxime or a combination of flucloxacillin and gentamicin or IV typoplanin uh, as prophylaxis for uh, a, a straightforward implant. If you have a patient who is known to have MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus, and we screen all of our patients for this, uh, then we would use typoplanin or vancomycin as the prophylaxis before the implant, uh, because these agents both would cover for MRSA. 
So getting the patient prepared, what I like to do is I like to identify the anatomical landmarks and it's very easy in a nice slim patient like this where you can see the clavicle very easily. Uh, here, we're just looking down the deltal pectoral groove, uh, which is where you might cut down for a cephalic implant. Uh, and then you can mark the skin if you like, uh, just uh, marking where you want the pocket to be, marking where your incision is going to go, and perhaps where your puncture is going to go if you're doing an auxiliary vein puncture. And so once you've prepped the skin, you've draped the patient, you've got your local anesthetic in, you've got to understand your surface anatomy. Um, in Edinburgh, our preferred approaches for vascular access are either a cephalic vein cut down, uh, which I like to, to use, and I use it not only in patients with lung disease, but I also encourage all of our trainees to learn that technique and to use it from time to time because it's tricky, it's a little fiddly getting into the cephalic vein compared with just puncturing the auxiliary vein. But when you have a patient who has bad chronic lung disease, um, then it is a really good technique to use. It reduces the stress level, completely eliminates the risk of pneumothorax. Uh, and it really is something that you should practice and learn how to do. The easiest cases are a single chamber implant uh, because you just have one lead to put in the cephalic vein. You don't get a lot of bleeding in between the two leads. Get yourself slick using that technique. Um, and uh, that, that, that's a, a good way to go. However, for speed, and because we have a lot of pressure on time in our theatres, for most implants, we use the auxiliary vein puncture. And the principle of doing this is that you use a relatively low approach and you aim for the first rib where the subclavian and then auxiliary vein, or the auxiliary rather than subclavian vein, pass over the first rib. And as long as you initially keep the tip of your needle shallow when it goes through the skin, and then when the tip is over the first rib, you change your angle so the tip is always pointing at the rib. Uh, the tip never goes over here into the thoracic inlet. Then in theory, it is impossible to cause a pneumothorax. Now I've actually once caused the pneumothorax doing that. And I realized the mistake I'd made afterwards. It was a very, very slim patient with a very odd shaped chest. But I thought I'd passed my needle quite shallow, but it had actually gone under the first rib. And when I punctured in the way, obviously I was very near the left lung and caused a pneumothorax. That was the last pneumothorax I had. That was about seven years ago, I think. Um, but generally using this technique, it is virtually impossible to cause pneumothorax. Now, some operators in Edinburgh will always do a left arm venogram before doing this kind of puncture. And I wouldn't criticize you for doing that. It's great to get an image up on the screen so that you can see where the vein is uh, and then you know where to aim for. But in practice, I find that with one or two passes of the needle, where you may initially pass the needle here and not hit the vein, and you just walk, pull the needle back and walk across here, and then if it's a posteriorly sighted vein, maybe over here, you're going to get it on the first, second, maybe third pass of the needle. And as long as you're over the rib, you're safe. And I find that's a bit quicker than using a venogram, but most of our trainees prefer to have the venogram in front of them. I think it's actually fine to use uh, either approach. And this is the x-ray view. So you can imagine your needle here. You've got to see on the x-ray where the first rib is curling round, clavicle over here. And this is the uh, venogram image superimposed. It's a really nice target, isn't it? Because you're aiming at where the vein intersects with the first rib. In this case, quite high up, just under the clavicle here. And you try and puncture reasonably laterally. What you don't want to do is puncture way over here in the angle between the clavicle and the first rib, because when the patient moves their shoulder, that acts like a pair of scissors. It's going to abrade on the insulation of the reed. The lead, you're going to have an insulation break. That's going to cause current drain from the device. And if you're unlucky, you're then going to have a conductor break and a fractured lead, which is no use. So once you're in, then you pass in a guide wire. Uh, you've got to be a little careful at this point because uh, when you take the 
syringe off the needle. If the patient has low venous pressure, particularly if they've been fasting for a while, there is a small risk of air getting sucked in here and an even greater risk when you pass your vascular sheath into the vein. So what you could opt to do is tilt the patient head down a little bit to make sure that the venous pressure is high enough that you don't get an air embolism. I've seen one or two cases of this where the patient has come to no harm, but on fluoroscopy, I've seen big air bubbles shunting backwards and forwards between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. And it's a very alarming appearance until the bubbles dissolve, which usually takes about 10 minutes. So to avoid that, tilt the patient head down. It also makes the vein bulge a bit and can make the access slightly easier. So just screen, make sure you're in the right place. Make sure that the guide wire is going across and then down the superior vena cava like this. Uh, so guide wire coming across here. This is where the first rib crosses over and it goes across and down. What you don't want is your guide wire going up here into the neck and then you introducing the sheath uh, because it's a real fiddle, um, pulling the sheath back, adjusting the lead and trying to get down here without losing your access. In terms of the first incision, the first cut that you make, um, you have to understand your surface markings. And so it's a good idea to look at the patient before you put the drapes on, maybe mark up with a marker pen. You don't need necessarily to mark the clavicle like this, um, but just mark if you're doing a cephalic vein cut down, then over the delta pectoral groove. And under the clavicle, you can either use a horizontal or oblique in incision like this, uh, and your pacemaker would sit in a pocket down here. The two things to avoid are having your incision too high and your pocket too high, because it's really sore if the header of the pacemaker is up against the clavicle. Any kind of shoulder movement, particularly when the patient lies on their left-hand side, is going to be very sore for them. So keep the top of the device away from the clavicle. So have your pocket far enough down here. Similarly, if you're making an incision in line with the shoulder, which is, is a perfectly good option, your pocket has to be far enough across that the pacemaker or ICD is not going to migrate over here and impinge on the head of the humerus. Because again, shoulder movements uh, may well uh, become a problem. Whoops, let me just go back a slide. And I can see Dr. Idafi has raised his hand. I am just going to try and find my menu here. Uh, Dr. Edafi, do you have a question for me? I'm trying to find my chat menu, but I can't see it in here. Just give me a second. Oh, I don't see any questions in the chat or in the Q&A, so you can continue. Okay, that's fine. Okay, no problem. So moving on from this, uh, we've marked up uh, where our incision is going to be, uh, like this. And then in this case, we're making an incision in, in line with the shoulder. So we're, we're making a deltal pectoral incision, having got our access first. Uh, incidentally, this raises the, the point, is it better to do your venogram uh, or your puncture, put your guide wire in before making the incision? Well, in my opinion, it probably is better to put the guide wire in before making your incision because the one anatomical abnormality you can identify and anticipate is a persistent left-sided superior vena cava. Uh, and if the patient has a left-sided superior vena cava, that is an anatomical variant where from the left side, the subclavian vein drains directly into a cable vein, which then connects with the coronary sinus, which is usually very large, which in turn connects in its normal position into the right atrium. So implanting a right ventricular pacing lead is tricky in these situations. It involves a 270 degree uh, loop in the lead before you can get into the right ventricle. And it makes it very difficult to steer the lead within the right ventricle. The atrial lead is very difficult to get into the appendage and may need to be attached into the free wall. 
So if you identify that it's a left SVC, you might actually swap over to the patient's right-hand side if you haven't already made an incision. For a capellic vein cut down, you don't have an opportunity to anticipate that unless you do, do a venogram, first of all, and identify that blood is flowing down uh, a left SVC from the, the venogram. So here we're making the incision from the puncture point down in line with the delta pectoral groove. Uh, incidentally, these are rather old images. I didn't have much chance to put new images together for this talk um, because I, I only got my invitation earlier in the week. So this was in the day when we didn't use disposable drapes and didn't use Ioban, but you, you get the idea uh, of what we're doing. So this is uh, us starting to make the pocket and the pocket needs to be in the plane of the deep fascia, which sits in front of the pectoralis major muscle. And there are quite a few pitfalls in making the pocket that our trainees need to avoid. The biggest problem is bleeding. The biggest problem undoubtedly is making the pocket too deep or trying to force the finger into the pocket uh, to enlarge it to the size of the pacemaker or ICD and pushing against resistance. Usually if you're pushing against a lot of resistance, it means you're not in the correct tissue plane uh, and, and therefore you should lift things up, look, alter the angle, angle of your light and make sure you're in the right plane and blunt dissect uh, with bisecting scissors. Don't just force it, don't tear the tissues. So the rookie mistakes that trainees sometimes make are not going deep enough and implanting the device particularly in an overweight patient uh, in the subcutaneous fat. If you do that, the device will erode and it will get infected. If you go too deep, then you're gonna get muscle tears. These are painful for the patient. It's difficult to get hemostasis. Diathermy doesn't work very well. And you usually end up having to tie off uh, bundles of muscle to stop bleeding. And it all gets a bit messy, particularly if the muscle tear is deep in the pocket where it's difficult to see where it's all coming from. Not securing hemostasis as you dissect. Well, I think when you cut through the skin, cut through the subcutaneous layers and get down to the fascia, before making your pocket, cauterize any bleeding points or tie off any bleeding points or just use manual pressure. But don't start making your pocket when there is blood coming down from the more superficial layers because when your pocket fills up with blood, it becomes very difficult to see any bleeding points within the pocket itself, and it all gets a bit out of control. So secure hemostasis as you go and take your time. The pocket has to be just the right size. So if you're not sure about the size of the device, get the physiologist to show you the device in the packet. You can see it through the see-through side of the packet and then make your pocket of a size that suits that particular device. The pocket's too small, you're gonna get skin necrosis, pain and erosion. And if the pocket's too big for the device, then the device can flip over or migrate uh, into a position that's not comfortable for the patient. In terms of the layer, um, in this image, you have to imagine that you're looking at a, a left lateral view of your patient and you're taking a slice through so here in blue outlined is the lung with the apex up here. We have a cross section of the clavicle here and the first rib here and our needle puncturing the vein. Uh, at an, th This is in a 90 degree orientation from the image that you saw before. You have the pectoralis major muscle, which has a clavicular attachment. You have the skin layer, the subcutaneous layer, and then you have the deep fascia. And it's in the deep fascial envelope just in front of pectoralis major muscle. That is the layer where you want your device to go. And you identify that because when you cut down, you see this glistening shiny fascia in front of the muscle. If you can see exposed muscle bundles, then you're going too deep and you need to make your pocket a little more superficially. Otherwise, when you push, you're at risk of tearing through one of those muscle bundles and causing a lot of bleeding. Anyway, we've made our pocket here. We now have uh, an introducer sheath, usually six or seven French, depending on the size of the lead. Uh, and this introducer sheath gives you your vascular access to, for lead placement. We advance it forward 
just warn the patient it might be a little uncomfortable as you push it in. And then it has a detachable dilator inner, which can be pulled out along with the guide wire. Some people will leave a guide wire down as a parachute wire so that they retain the vascular access. I think that's quite a handy thing to do. Um, some people just take everything out and leave the sheath in place. Um, be careful to put your thumb over the end of this uh, while you're getting your lead ready, just in case the patient takes a deep breath in and causes an air embolism. Once your lead is in and placed within the vein, you can split away the sheath at that point, and then there's no risk of air embolism around the side of the sheath. And you can get on with lead placement. And the way that permanent pacing leads are steered into position in the heart uh, is using these stilettes, uh, which are designed to be the same length as the lead, which you can put a shape on to steer the lead through the various cardiac structures. And I'm going to talk to you briefly about uh, stilette technique. Uh, I like to make a, a, an arc about that size on the stilette for a right ventricular pacing lead, because that kind of arc will take you through the tricuspid valve and up into the, uh, the main pulmonary artery. Um, and if you pass your lead up into the pulmonary artery, you know for definite that when you pull it back, it's going to be in the right ventricle. Otherwise, you can be fooled by accidentally placing the lead into the coronary sinus uh, when you don't intend to. So when you're advancing the lead down, just be careful that the end of the sheath doesn't push too hard against the wall of the superior vena cava. Otherwise, you can dissect it uh, or even uh, rupture the superior vena cava. Uh, so on fluoroscopy, make sure your sheath's pulled back maybe to about here, and then you can advance your lead down safely uh, into the right atrium. So the lead's coming around here, down the superior vena cava, and into the right atrium. And you do that either with a straight stilette or with a stilette withdrawn a little bit to make the tip of the lead a bit more floppy to take the corner of the superior vena cava. And your next job is to get the lead through this tricuspid valve, which sits in this kind of plane here. So you put your stilette down the lead like this, put a curve on it. Sometimes, depending on your curve, it'll actually take you into the right ventricle quite nicely, but I like to put a big loop like I showed you, on to take us up into the pulmonary artery first and then drop down. In patients with severe tricuspid incompetence, sometimes the lead doesn't go where you want it to go, and you have to prolapse a loop of the lead through the tricuspid valve and then use a straight stilette to push the tip of the lead in towards the apical septum or mid septum uh, for your lead placement. Uh, this is the, my preferred technique, which is uh, taking the lead up into the right ventricular outflow tract like that, and then you know you're definitely in the right ventricle. Put a straight stilette in or a stilette with a, a, a slight curve on it and just retract the lead back and it will drop down, usually drop down the septum. I'll sometimes attach the lead here with the helix or sometimes take it down to the apex. Uh, so this is just a plural view of the lead in the right ventricular outflow tract. You often get uh, quite a lot of ventricular ectopics when you're there, so don't hang around there for too long before you pull it down into the body of the RV. Drop it down, and then maybe just advance it in towards the apex here. It's maybe a bit of a low position with this lead, but it would be okay for an apical position. Uh, your LEO 40 degree view can be quite helpful. Um, LEO views are, are commonly used by electrophysiologists when we're trying to get leads into the coronary sinus and by CRT implanters as well. And uh, your um, lead will point in this direction if you're in the coronary sinus, and it will point in this direction if you're at the apex of the right ventricle. Uh, so use your LEO view if you're in any doubt about where your lead is. Now for septal lead positioning, some people will put a large um, sweeping curve on the stilette, followed by a secondary left-hand curve, directing the tip of the lead into the intraventricular septum where you can actively fix it. Uh, and that can work quite well. And sometimes if you happen to be pacing close to the right bundle branch, you'll recruit the Hisperkinji system and get a relatively narrow QRS. And adapted versions of this technique are actually used for left bundle branch area pacing 
or physiological pacing, which is something I'm not going to be going into today. For the atrial lead, if you're using an active fixation atrial lead, it naturally sits um, in a straight position and it needs to be directed into the appendage of the right atrium using a J stilet. For bigger patients, I use the long J that comes in the pack. And for smaller patients, I use the short J. And when the lead is hooked up into the appendage, it, in the AP view, it kicks from left to right like a windscreen wiper. And so you've got a good idea if it's in the appendage by looking for the kick. You then deploy the helix in, in here. I use a magnified X-ray view when I'm watching the helix deploy in the right ventricle and right atrium. And I turn the helix mechanism at about one turn per second until I can see that the helix is deployed. And then I very gently pull the stilet back to make sure that the lead is properly attached. I sometimes get, if I'm in any doubt about the security of the lead, I'll get the patients to take a deep breath while screening and to cough and to sniff hard. And sniffing hard makes the diaphragm go up and down. And that allows you to check the security of your lead uh, very nicely. Once the leads are in position, you can check the current of injury. And this is on a, a rather old uh, pacing system analyzer. This is the uh, intracardiac recording from a right ventricular pacing lead, which is well embedded in the right ventricular apex. And you can see that this looks like tombstone ST segment elevation. And it's the one situation in medicine where you like to see ST elevation like this, uh, because that's a sign that the lead is firmly embedded in the myocardium without having perforated or gone through where you would otherwise see a surface looking ECG. So there's quite a lot of evidence that if you get your lead into a position where there's a good injury current, so a good amount of ST segment elevation, this correlates with good sensing values from the, the lead and also good threshold values. So you don't wanna see this, which looks like a surface recording. You want to see this, which is a good current of injury. Uh, and the evidence base for that is, is reasonably strong. Um, you can look up that reference uh, if you want to see more detail on this. Then once your lead's in position, you're going to check the various uh, pacing parameters. Um, depending on how you're connected up, we'd usually be connected in bipolar pacing mode, so you wouldn't necessarily see nice pacing spikes like this. But the evoked P wave is usually a slightly different morphology to the uh, intrinsic sinus P wave. And certainly the evoked QRS complex is going to be different to the patient's intrinsic QRS complex. And on the pacing system analyzer, you will see not only the pacing uh, artifact marked on the marker channel, but you also see the evoked signal uh, produced by pacing. And so the cardiac physiologist will probably concentrate more on the intracardiac signals than the surface ECG. You as the operator will be looking at the monitor in the theater, uh, just looking as the voltage threshold is checked for loss of atrial capture or loss of ventricular capture. It's all done by connecting up crop clips to the lead in this fashion here. So ideally for a, a Brady implant, uh, you'd be looking for a lead impedance of between 400 and 1200 ohms. If the lead impedance is very high, check your connections. It may just be that you're not connected properly, or you've got some dry blood on the hub of the lead that you need to wipe off with some saline and reconnect up. If the lead impedance is extremely low, then it implies that you've got a short circuit somewhere. This makes sure that um, the, where you're connected is away from the tissue interface. And if you've got persistently low impedance, if there's a possibility you might have damaged the lead somehow during the implant, you may need to pull it out again uh, and change it for another one. For sensing, uh, you're ideally looking for atrial sensing greater than two millivolts and ventricular sensing greater than six millivolts. Um, but, you know, sometimes if you tried three or four lead positions in a patient with a diseased heart and you're just not getting that good sensing values, you just go for the best you can get. What you don't want to do is try 10 or 15 different positions in the heart, because in these patients with diseased, baggy, unhealthy hearts, multiple lead positioning attempts 
can result in perforation and cardiac tamponade, and you don't want that. Similarly with the threshold, your ideal threshold for the atrium is less than 1.5 volts at 0 0.5 millisecond pulse width, and less than a volt for the right ventricular pacing lead. Um, bear in mind that with active fixation leads, the threshold may be quite high when you first connect up the crop clips, but if everything else looks okay, if it's a good anatomical position, good sensing, it looks good on the x-ray, it's worth waiting two or three minutes because the threshold will come down in most cases uh, by quite a big margin. And if you see the threshold falling steeply, just take that position, don't keep moving the lead around. And then when you're happy with these values, you can try high output pacing. From the atrial lead, you're just making sure that it's pointing forwards away from the phrenic nerve. And you can check in an REO view that it is. And with the right ventricular lead, if you're in an inferior position with the lead, just making sure that you're not capturing the diaphragm directly. Then you get the device out from the box. It comes with a, a screwdriver here, um, and it's a ratchet screwdriver, so you can't over tighten the uh, screws. Always check the serial number of the lead uh, against the reference from the physiologist to make sure you're co connecting the correct lead into the correct port. Reversing the leads is a complete pain and will mean that your patient needs another operation to, to sort it out. So check the serial numbers, check you're connecting the correct lead into the correct port, make sure the pin is fully home. And if the pin keeps pushing out, then put your screwdriver in to break the seal where it goes into the hex screw and that will expel some air and allow you to fully push the lead home into the socket. Sorry, Dr. Dr. Grab. Yes. Thank you very much. There's a question in the chat from Dr. Daffy. Do you gain do you gain access via ultrasound method? Uh, thank you, Dr. Adafi, for your question. Um, that, that is a very good question. An ultrasound-guided subclavian puncture or auxiliary puncture is a very good method for accessing the venous circulation. Uh, I personally do not use that method. Uh, I will use a fluoro-guided auxiliary vein puncture, sometimes with a venogram, or capallic vein access with a cut down. Um, but many of our trainees uh, are enthusiastic about using ultrasound for both femoral and uh, subclavian access. And I think it's a very good method. It's very safe. The risk of pneumothorax is minimal using that. And uh, I, I think it's uh, one of several good methods that you can use. Regarding your second question about capallic vein access, um, I, I find that that is too much of a hassle with CRT devices. Uh, three leads in the capallic vein, you often get lead-lead interactions. Um, so you are uh, maybe um, slitting for the LV lead. You've got your atrial lead and right atrial lead and right ventricular lead in place. And when you pull the sheath back, when you're slitting, you end up displacing one of the other leads. Um, I think it's not worth the hassle. I have done capellate vein access for CRT at times when I've struggled with access into the axillary vein and it's, it's worked, um, but I haven't liked it very much. So I usually do a triple axillary vein puncture uh, if I'm implanting a CRT device, uh, or I might put the RV lead in through the capellate vein, but usually a triple axillary vein puncture. It's quick. <clears throat> I think it's safe using the fluoro technique or ultrasound. Uh, and that's what I would do. There's, there's another question from Dr. Yakubu. Uh, yeah. Do you always create pocket before implanting leads? <clears throat> so that's uh, another very good question, uh, Dr. Yakubu. Um, there is debate about whether that's the right thing to do, but yes, that is what I do. And the reason that I make the pocket first is that if there's going to be any bleeding appearing in the pocket, then it will have declared itself by the time I'm ready to put the device in the pocket because it's gonna take me you know, five minutes, maybe 10 minutes in a tricky case to get the RE and RB lead into position. So if there are any slow bleeding points or bleeding points that are gonna start up, then that will become obvious by the time I'm ready to put the device in the pocket. 
Whereas if you make it the pocket at the end and just put the device in straight away and start closing, then it could start up bleeding. The argument against doing what I, what I do, which is making the pocket first, um, people say, well, if the pocket is open for longer, then there's a greater risk of infection. And that's true. The longer you have an open wound, the greater the risk of infection. But I think making the pocket um, doesn't constitute an open wound because you've made your pocket and then the tissues kind of come back against each other like that again once you've made the pocket and you're working with your leads. So I don't think bacteria get into the pocket airborne while you're working away on the leads. Um, I think a better way of avoiding uh, bacterial contamination into the pocket is not to have your leads or device out and exposed on the tray uh, where all your instruments are for any longer than they need to be. So don't open the packet that the pacemaker is in until the very last minute. Don't open the leads uh, from their packet until you're ready to put them in. Because if they're lying on the trolley for half an hour, then they are more likely to get contaminated. But having the, uh, I make the pocket first because I think it's better for hemostasis and I don't really believe that it will get contaminated after that uh, just by being there. I hope that answers your question. There's another one. I'm not, I'm not sure, Dr. Grab, if you've almost finished your presentation and because the questions are coming in thick and fast. So. Yeah, I've almost finished that. Uh, so shall I just finish up and then I can take the questions? Uh, yeah. Yeah, is that okay? I think that's fine, yeah. Okay, so sorry, it's taking a little while. Uh, suturing down the lead, I suture down with a permanent silk suture. The uh, suture has to be attached to the pectoralis muscle uh, first, and then it has to be tight enough that the lead uh, does not slip through the suture sleeve, but not so tight that you're going to cut through the insulation uh, of the lead. Um, the lead has to be in with enough slack that when the patient sits up and the diaphragm drops down, the lead isn't going to pull out from its insertion point. So a little extra slack in the lead before you tie the lead down. Attaching in like here in the way I've described, pop the device into the pocket well away from the shoulder. And then closure, I usually do it in two layers with an absorbable suture. So a continuous running suture back and forth, superficial to deep, deep to superficial, all the way down like this trying to get the skin edges opposed as neatly as possible. Uh, so this is the, the kind of technique, well, actually this, I put the wrong image up here because I was in a rush preparing my slide. But what you want is your skin edges to come together like that, not like that. That's how you get bacterial contamination into your pocket. And so this is closure here. And then for the uh, skin layer or subcuticular layer itself. I prefer to use a straight suture, actually. This is the subcuticular technique, just going back and forth in a subcuticular layer like that. And then you pull each end and it comes together nicely like a zipper. We have a mnemonic that we use in Edinburgh to confirm that you've got everything in the right place called FASO. The P is position, ensuring the device is implanted in the correct place on the chest. H is hemostasis. Make sure you've got that as it's a major determinant of infection risk. Alignment is making sure your lead positions are, in, are good and that you have enough slack. Security is making sure the helices are deployed and the suture sleeves are anchoring correctly. And orientation is the device sitting nicely in the pocket away from the shoulder, away from the clavicle before you close. Oops. So to conclude, about device implantation technique, use a preoperative checklist and make sure you're doing the right thing, you have everything in place before you start. Be meticulous with preparation, particularly skin prep. Choose the correct device for the patient so as avoiding upgrade procedures. Remember phaso and educate your patient about signs of infection after you've done the implant so that they know to call for help early if any kind of problem occurs. Thank you very much. That's fantastic, Dr. Grab. That was that was really, really good. Well presented. Thank you.
Very, very interesting. Um, I've got a quick question, if I could open the floor. Um, what are the advantages of using dissolvable stitches over non-dissolvable? So I, I think the advantage of dissolvable stitches for our patients is um, mainly that the patient doesn't need to have sutures removed afterwards. So when we discharge them, they don't need an additional visit to the cardiology department or to uh, their um, family practitioner to have sutures removed. There is an argument that using interrupted non-absorbable sutures uh, may produce less of a tissue reaction and be better for uh, tissue healing. Um, and there's an argument that sometimes the absorbable suture, the vicryl or polysorb doesn't uh, dissolve properly and you end up with little fragments of suture under the skin. And this is true for, for, for some patients when they come back to the device clinic, you end up having to pull them out um, and, and that can be a bit of a pain um, but for us, it's convenience. Uh, I find that they work very well. Uh, they usually dissolve very nicely and it avoids an extra uh, visit to the clinic for, for the patient themselves. Now, I Great. see a, a question in the chat saying, do you like to prolapse the RV lead into the right ventricle or do you pass it straight? Um, so uh, passing the lead straight is okay. And sometimes the lead will go straight through but if you're doing it that way with the stilet fully driven to the end of the lead, you've got to be very careful not to push the lead too hard. Otherwise, you can end up pushing the lead through the right ventricular free wall. Prolapsing is quite a nice technique because it takes the belly of the lead through the tricuspid valve. Um, and that's a, obviously a blunt end that's going through. And then you can just push the tip through using a straight stilet. It's, it's really quite a nice way of getting the lead into the right ventricle. So, um, I, th I think if you're going straight through with the tip of the lead through the tricuspid valve, just be careful to screen and make sure you're not trying to push the lead when it doesn't want to move forwards. Anyone else? Dr. Daffy, you said you had many, many questions. Yeah, uh, uh, very good. Uh, Dr. Graf, thank you so much for uh, the great educations and the teachings today. We are very grateful, sir. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Adafi. It's nice to, to get the opportunity to present. Yes, sir. Um, one of the, um, especially sometimes that lead, if you want to push it into uh, the right ventricle, you may accidentally enter into the coronary sinus. How do you know about that, sir? Have, has it ever happened to you? You are doing a pacemaker, you want to push the lead in and accidentally you go into the coronary sinus. Uh, it, it happens a lot. <laughs> and yeah. we, we have a, a running joke in Edinburgh that when we're doing a CRT implant, it's impossible to find the coronary sinus. And when you're doing an RV pacing lead, it always goes into the coronary sinus when you don't want it to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, but it's a very good question because you want to avoid putting an active fixation uh, RV pacing lead into a coronary sinus. So uh, the clue is that the lead will point up towards the patient's left shoulder um, in the AP view when you All are right. advancing the lead. And when you move, your the, the lead will not have a great deal of freedom of movement. So when you try and put a straight stilet down it, it, it won't drop down in the way that it would do if it was in the outflow tract. Yeah, the absence of ventricular ectopic beats should be a clue that you're not in the right place. Whereas if you're in the right ventricular outflow tract, you usually get a lot of um, RV outflow tract ectopy and sometimes even non-sustained VT. Mm. Uh, and the final thing is that if you're in any doubt about your position, you can connect without deploying the lead. You can connect the lead up to the PSA and look at the electrogram. And if it yes, looks if it looks atrial, then you're in the coronary sinus. Uh, and if it looks like an RVOT, well, if it looks like a ventricular electrogram, particularly if there's an injury on it, uh, then you're in RVOT. Okay. Uh, the other thing is your LEO 40 degree view is your friend. Uh, and that will show you if the lead is in a very posterior position, then you're in the coronary sinus and you need to pull it out. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, sir. And, very uh, good. Can I, can I also add um, that 
Um, if you're in the RVOT, uh, what from physiologists might do, which I always tell the physiologists in Nigeria and, and elsewhere, is to place an electrode on the right side, maybe in the um, fourth intercostal space on the like maybe it's like V four position on the right side, um, so that when you look at if if the lead is in the RVOT, you should get a left bundle branch morphology coming. And that, so that's also a good, a big, a good clue that you are in the RVOT coming. Is that right, Dr. Graf? That's absolutely right. And and um, we we actually like to have a, a V1 uh, electrogram for most of our implants. Anyway, it's certainly very useful with CRT because you want to you want to see a right bundle branch block morphology with LB pacing. And sometimes if you don't have a very good choice of veins to pace through. So you're going mm. through a branch of the middle cardiac vein or the great cardiac vein if you're anterior, and you're mm. not sure if you're too far septal, uh, then looking at the morphology in V1 can be really useful. And so having that V1 electrode, it, it's a little bit in the way of the fluoroscopy when you're doing the implant, but not too much. Uh, that can show you if you've got a left or right bundle branch block uh, morphology. It's, it's, it's pretty handy. Yeah, and, and also even if you maybe perforate a slightly joint joint implant um when you, if you're pacing from it it it, it might show a right bundle branch morphology because it's obviously it might be touching the left bundle that's so, right yeah, so it's really really helpful like dr grabby saying it tells you so many things good thank you very much then the other question dr grab is on um is on the uh, uh, the access Regarding the assets, I think uh, over the years, uh, what I think is that any assets that you are used to always be very good at taking it so that you don't have a problem. Uh, the issue of um, hemotora, nemotora, I have never had it in my practice. Uh, uh, the reason is that you have to be very good in picking if you are if you are using your axillary access, always be extremely good in picking it. Before I take any access, I will first of all do a scan or a scat of what's what the first rib look like and how the clavicle crosses the first rib. That gives me a lot of information on how to go about it. Then if I am not sure of what I'm looking at, the second thing is, just take your venogram straight and see where the uh where the uh, where the vein passes through because <clears throat> even when uh, uh, Tim, uh, dr timpley came uh, to visit us in abuja in may this year i told him one thing that yeah uh, the first rib is a landmark to take a puncture on um on the uh, axillary vein where it crosses the clavicle uh, but sometimes you you have a reasonable number of patients among us here in Nigeria that that vein does not cross that place. And when we started, we did 20 something cases in that visit, <clears throat> but we also noticed the same thing that you go for that first rib, you may not cash it. And if you don't cash it, second is that just go for your venogram. And once the venogram comes, you will notice that most time that vein crosses the second rib. And as the, the, uh, the flow is still going on, we just take a stick on it and we move on with our procedure. And it has been very wonderful now. We don't see any issue on it. So thank God you answer me on the issue of the, uh, the cephalic vein when you are having three leads, especially if you are doing a CRT, if you pass those three leads there, because it's a smaller vein, if you pass those three leads there, you may have an issue in peeling off your peel-off sheet and you may get one of those leads get dislodged. So it's a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. But I want to take you a little bit out of the presentation. Uh, <clears throat> do you have any ideas on the issue of diaphragmatic pacing, sir? This is out of what you presented today, sir. So do you mean with CRT? No. Uh, there are some people who had um, uh, who had a spinal cord injury at the level of C1, C2, and the phrenic nerve is still intact. 
And because of the injury at the level of C1, C2, they may go into uh, hypoventilation or inability to ventilate properly. And you would like to, uh, to use the aromatic way of, because if you don't stimulate the phrenic nerve, they will be totally dependent on, um, on a ventilator for life. Yeah. Then also congenital issues, like in children, some of them have hypoventilatory syndrome and they may require that. I know it's not a cardiology uh, issue because we have a patient currently that had this issue and the surgeons have, they have approached me several times. I told them I don't do it. Um, so I just want to know what idea you have about it. So I... It, I, it's something I have no expertise in uh, is, is um, diaphragmatic pacing uh, for patients with hypoventilation syndromes or, or uh, diaph you know, where they have an interrupted nerve supply, but where they yeah. have a viable diaphragm. Uh, I can see if I can get some information from our thoracic team in case uh, uh, Beautiful. there is anything available there. But I, I don't think this is a treatment we use in, in Edinburgh. Um, okay. Just touching on the point you made earlier about vascular access and avoiding mm. hemothorax, I, I think you're absolutely correct that if you use the correct technique, hemothorax should never occur. Uh, yes. And, I, and I've never seen hemothorax <clears throat> with any of my implants or any of my colleagues' implants. And I described that one case of pneumothorax, which clearly was a mistake from me uh, in... in <laughs> A patient with a slightly unusual chest anatomy but yeah but i completely agree with you that if you try and puncture over the first rib and you don't find the vein when you do the venogram the vein is usually sitting in a very low position uh, and coming up at quite a steep angle and you need to puncture lower down than than you originally thought so probably over the second rib is is an ideal place for that Thank you, sir. Great teachings. I learned a lot today from your teachings today, sir. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? I think Dr. Kuru was trying to say something, but I'm not sure. Oh no, I don't. I don't think. I, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> any any other questions? This is really good. Um, make the most of Dr. Grab. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the question I was asking about dissolvable stitches and only are there any differences in infection risk um, between them? Because because my center they tend to use non dissolvable a lot. Um, <laughs> And whereas in, in Aberdeen, where I was, it was mostly dissolvable. I think um, Dr. Afalta, I think, used non-dissolvable, I think, if my memory serves me right. So I, I don't think there's a hard evidence base about this. Um, it's uh, if, if you look online at the information about dissolvable versus non-dissolvable, um, sutures and there's a website that I've referenced in one of my slides called howtopace.com uh, and howtopace.com discusses this a little bit in its section on suturing technique. It's a very good website incidentally uh, to refer to um, and uh, the authors of that website favour the non-dissolvable suture. I, I'm in two minds about this. I, I understand the argument that a dissolvable suture uh, is going to be present in the tissues for longer. And I guess if there's any contamination on it, it might find form a nidus for, for infection. Um, but conversely, if you have sutures going through the skin that are sitting there for a week to 10 days, uh, then surely that could form a conduit for infection to get from the skin surface down into the subcutaneous layers. Um, I think the truth is when you, you look at the strength of evidence and the recommendations for EHRA, there's not a strong opinion given in either direction about this. Brilliant. 
Thank you. Yeah, and I would say that um, I agree with Dr. Grubb. I would say that, you know, it really depends on the patient, right? So for the oh. non-absorbable um, sutures, so I'm thinking that you're, you're saying proline um, or using staples even, right? That would be for a patient who, you know, can follow directions, keeps the wound dry, you know, doesn't get it wet for that first 10 days while the skin fully heals, right? Versus when we're talking about a patient who, um, you know, you kind of doubt their compliance, then an absorbable suture might be better um, where you can, you know, put some dermabond over it and the patient can get it wet but um, you, you can be rest assured that it probably won't get infected um, despite the patient's best effort. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is though, there is a difference between, you know, I, I think Dr. Grubb had made mention of this, the um, braided versus non-braided suture. And so um, a lot of times people will tell you that for the skin and for the outermost um, layer, you should use a monocryl and not a Vicro, because Vicro is absorbable, but it's a braided suture. Monocryl is a monofilament. And there is evidence that the um, non-braided suture is better um, for infection versus the braided suture. So those are two separate questions. I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that. Yeah, the, these are very good points and, and thank you for that. Uh, I, I would put one caveat into my earlier comment about using non-absorbable sutures. Generally, uh, if I'm reoperating for any reason, so if I'm asked to do a lead reposition in somebody who's had an early lead dis dislodgement uh, or a patient who's developed a hematoma that has required evacuation by me and I'm having to re-suture a wound for a second time, then I will, I will use non-absorbable sutures the second time. I don't want to go back through the same tissue uh, with my subcuticular suture in particular, uh, because the tissue quality is pretty poor by that stage. Uh, and I'll use an interrupted um, non-absorbable suture. Uh, and the other situation is when I'm closing up after a device extraction where the tissue quality is usually pretty bad and the skin edges don't come together very well uh, with a subcuticular stitch. Fantastic. Anyone, any questions? Last chance or forever hold your tongue. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. I think I think that's it then. Uh, Gina, sorry, sorry. sorry. You know, when Dr. Uh, Graf was presenting, he talked about uh, pers uh, persistent left uh, SVC. Yes, okay. that's right. Yeah. What do you do, sir, when you when you encounter persistent left, uh, left SVC for a pacemaker and for a CRT? What, are, what do you do in those cases, sir? So, um, personally, I... I... Uh, actually try and place the leads through the persistent left SVC. Uh, I think with practice, it's reasonably straightforward to put an RV apical pacing lead in, um, but, but what you have to do is make a loop in the right atrium uh, and then allow the lead to re-enter the, or to enter the right ventricle after going round that loop. Uh, and with a little bit of patience and perseverance and playing around with stilet shapes, can usually get close to the apex of the right ventricle. I think it's quite hard to get up onto the septum from there, but uh, apical position is okay. And with you can fashion a stilet to take you up to the upper part of the right atrium, not necessarily right into the apex of the appendage uh, from there. Uh, with CRT, I've only had one case like that, um, and it was a very interesting guy. Uh, it was a CRTD. And my patient had this amazing tattoo over his left shoulder. I remember very clearly. Uh, it was a tattoo of a snake. And uh, it was beautifully done. It was a work of art. And my incision was going to go right through his tattoo. Uh, and so I, I resolved to be very careful with my suturing technique at the end to get the edges of the skin together like that. But it, CRTD is quite a bulky device. 
And uh, when we were putting the leads down, we discovered the left SVC. But I was able to find a branch of the coronary sinus via the left SVC that we could put the LB lead into, and it worked beautifully. Uh, and I could get an RB and R an RE lead in, uh, and it was absolutely fine. I think there was a bit of luck involved with that, though. But when we closed up with the big device up over the shoulder, it looked like his snake had swallowed a rat. There was a huge bulge <laughs> in the belly of the snake. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, sir. Because we have I have encountered it in some occasions here. Uh, what I did in most of those occasions, I went to the right and implanted from there. That is the truth. There's nothing wrong with that. I think that's absolutely fine. Yes, sir. And I agree I, with that. Like I, I usually will go to the right as well. And the main reason why is because, like Dr. Grubb, I do you know some extractions, and I always have you know, thoughts mm. of, oh, just in case something happens, it would just be, you know, such a pain to go through the left SVC to extract something. That's what I'm, I'm basically thinking about when I'm doing that. Um, but That's he's correct. Good. Like a CRT is actually very easy to put in because clearly mm. you're in the coronary sinus, you know, okay. and so it, it ends up becoming really easy to actually do through the persistent left um than to do you know through the right um yeah but yeah there are some times though that um well two things the first thing is the persistent left i've seen enough persistent left that mm. that's why i typically will always do a left-sided venogram before i put in my beads just because i would say probably about maybe one percent of patients who have done um, devices in maybe one to two percent i've seen like I see at least two or three a year that are enough for me to basically say, okay, you know what? I don't want to have to discover this by putting down a wire because I know I would go on the opposite side. So I always do a left side of the brain. So that's number one. And then the second thing is, um, you know, I'm also thinking about like, maybe if I have to upgrade, will it become an issue and also extraction. Um, so I go to the left. But the other thing to think about though, is I had only one patient that I've seen this where she had a persistent left but then she also did not have the right SVC. So really the wow. only option for her was to go through the left. And so when you see that, you should do a right-sided venogram because there is their persistent left might be as a result of um, what we call a heterotaxy, where you have these venous malformations and you just know where um, there might be a problem. So don't take it as... A, a given that the patient will have just because they have a persistent left, they will also have a right. They might actually not have one. And you don't want to yeah. discover that when your lead is coiling up, you know, on the right yeah. side. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Joma. Yeah, I think that's all good advice. And nobody would criticize you. And it's very safe, very good practice to always do a venogram. Uh, and maybe I'm a little lazy and not doing that for every single case. Oh, hardly. I think it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just me. I'm just, I, I go the other way. <laughs> but a very good point about extraction. I would not like to pass an extraction sheath down a left SVC. It would make me feel very nervous indeed not least because of the sharp angle you'd need to go down uh, from the axillary vein into, into that left SVC. Right. I think, are there any more questions? Right, I think, I think, I think we're, I think that was really well presented, Dr. Grubb, and we're really thankful um, to you for doing this, taking the time to do this for us. Yes. Uh, and and we're looking for plenty, many more in the future from you um, to share your expertise on this platform. Uh, I'd be delighted to. Uh, thanks for inviting me. And it's great to meet you all. Um, I better go now because I think my dinner is on the table. <laughs> thank you sir thank you so much thank, thank you, you Dr. Rob. enjoy thank your you meal thank you thank you Dr. Thank you Dr. Daffy thank you thank you, thank you. So thank you.